subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. I've been asked to speak, as you've heard, about the Indo-Pacific uh, concept that has recently gained uh, greater salience in diplomatic conversations. Uh, but this is a business gathering. Uh, and uh, my effort today would be to convince all of you why the Indo-Pacific matters in your life as well. In doing so, I expect to set at rest some of the misconceptions in that regard. Hopefully, uh, that would contribute to an even wider understanding of an approach that has actually been gathering increasing traction in recent days. So, what is the Indo-Pacific really about? Literally, it signifies the confluence of the Indian and the Pacific Oceans that can no longer be handled as distinct spheres. We are speaking of a maritime space that connects Africa, Asia, Eurasia's Pacific Coast, Oceania, and the Pacific Coast of the Americas. Over 50% of global trade traverses through this maritime domain. It is also home to over 64% of the world's population and 62% of the global GDP. And obviously, the security, stability, peace, and prosperity of this vast region is vital for the world. Now, why then are we looking at it in a joint rather than a separate manner? It is always tempting to speak of grand strategy and nuanced diplomatic uh, signaling. The truth, uh, however, is far more prosaic. Whether it is the yardsticks of trade and investment, connectivity and travel, or politics and security, what begins in the Pacific no longer ends there. And the same holds true for the Indian Ocean. In essence, the landscape, capabilities, and activities are now very, very different. Every nation and region would have its own version of this reality. But I can speak for India and say this. It captures a mix of our broadening horizons, widening interests, and globalized activities. Many would agree with us. Others could actually offer additional justification. Indo-Pacific, for some, can also be a resource optimization uh, in, a, in a bigger, in an enlarged arena, or just a desire to contribute better to global challenges that now transcend old boundaries. Many have also chosen in that process to reaffirm basic principles like adherence to the rule of law. What is worth recognizing, however, is that analysis lags behind developments. As I have actually written in the book which Jamshed mentioned, Indo-Pacific is not tomorrow's forecast, but yesterday's reality. Now, this change actually reflects a regional manifestation of uh, what is a uh, what are a set of larger global trends. As societies have got more globalized and power distribution rebalanced, the interests of many now extend way beyond their near proximity. This trend has been particularly strong in Asia, which has been at the heart of a new economic resurgence. Whether viewed from the perspective of resources, endeavors, or challenges, it is therefore no longer realistic to confine our thinking within the earlier box. Doing so would either mean we are being deliberately outdated or that we have chosen to make only selective exceptions. Neither, of course, suits India or indeed much of the international community. Denying Indo-Pacific is tantamount to refuting globalization. Who owns the Indo-Pacific as a concept is a debate in itself. There is as much history there as a diversity of opinion. The fact is, 
pretty much everyone who recognizes how important an understanding of the uh, Indo-Pacific has become to their lives has a point of view. The contemporary record shows that India and Japan were actually the early movers, Australia and US uh, somewhat later. The ASEAN announced its approach last year. Others in Asia have joined in as well. France, Germany, the Netherlands have all recently enunciated their uh, official uh, Indo-Pacific policies. And I just heard uh, two days ago from the British Foreign Secretary about their Indo-Pacific tilt. In that sense, it is truly a pluralistic exercise on the importance of a theater with the resulting ideas about you know, its future and how it's going to evolve. This active debate should be treated as a recognition of reality and a statement of priority. Quite appropriately, much of it revolves around the ASEAN, whose East Asia Summit initiative has actually long had its own Indo-Pacific connotations. Now, how does all of this unfold? Uh, given that uh, this region is primarily a maritime space, countries are naturally focused on building practical cooperation in that domain. A safe, secure, and stable maritime space is a necessary condition for peace, security, and prosperity. Conversely, Threats there imperil human security in all its dimensions, whether by disrupting commerce, disturbing the ecology, or creating disputes over ownership and rights. In our interdependent world, the complexity of such challenges has become too large for any one nation to address by itself. Indeed, the very vastness of this arena brings out the need for collaborative action and why that has now become so pressing. Naturally, the individual interests of countries uh, are at stake, but then so too is their collective benefit in ensuring that the global commons is better secured. It is this challenge of harmonizing the pulls and pressures that the Indo-Pacific policy of all players need to address today. Now, most of us at this summit would, I think, intuitively appreciate why India needs to give the Indo-Pacific its fullest attention. They will recall that the era of reform uh, began with the Lukis policy and the extension of our activities to the ASEAN. They would also remember that in due course, this paved the way for a much more intensive engagement with East Asia and Oceania, with Japan, Korea, China, Australia. It took, uh, in fact, but a few years for uh, more of India's trade to move eastwards, to be conducted eastwards than westwards. To the change of direction was also added additional facets of cooperation ranging from connectivity uh, to security. The look east thereby became the act east. And it kept growing. We are now reaching out to the Pacific coast of the United States and Canada, just as we do much more with Latin America. Our engagement with the Pacific Islands has become serious. So far, so far from being an arcane issue of international relations, the Indo-Pacific is actually a bread and butter expression of our political, economic, connectivity, travel, and societal interests. It actually relates to everything that all of you do every day. And it relies heavily on ensuring the safety and security of the maritime domain. To give that a practical shape, India has proposed an Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative at the East Asia Summit in November last year. The IPOI, as the acronym goes, is aimed at furthering practical cooperation as an open, 
non-treaty based global initiative. It has seven pillars that address different aspects of the challenges that international community faces. The range from maritime security, maritime ecology, maritime resources, capacity building and resource training, to disaster risk reduction and management, science, technology, and academic cooperation, and finally, trade, connectivity, and maritime transport. The IPOI is an inclusive and open initiative seeking to better manage, conserve, sustain, and secure the maritime domain. It does not envisage creating a new institutional framework and will rely on the ASEAN-led East Asia Summit framework, though not necessarily limited to it. Think of it this way. It is, it is like a lowest common denominator approach to shared problems that we all know require urgent and coordinated solutions. India will be the driving force, obviously, behind all the areas under identified under IPOI. But we are also exploring partnerships with like-minded countries. Since the announcement of IPOI in November 2019, Australia, Japan, and ASEAN member states have all expressed willingness to work with India in these areas. In fact, Australia and Japan have agreed to lead on IPOI pillars on maritime ecology and connectivity, respectively. Given India's inherent strengths in the Indian Ocean region, we are keen to take the lead in disaster risk reduction and maritime security. India, as many of you know, has been the first responder for HADR, that is the Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Response uh, Situations, in this uh, region, especially since 2015. It has been, in fact, a pretty much a regular effort for us, sometimes with more than one country annually. Uh, and I can, you know, there's a long list out there, but I can say this, that uh, this year, providing uh, COVID relief to uh, Maldives, Mauritius, Madagascar, Comoros, Seychelles, including by deputing our people there, as also medicines to the Pacific Islands, these are the latest uh, in that line of uh, endeavors. India co-chairs the ADMM Plus, this is the ASEAN Defense Minister's meeting, ADMM Plus Expert Working Group on HADR with Indonesia. And we are also presently the lead country for disaster risk management in the Indian Ocean RIM Association, IORA. We have a tsunami early warning system in the Indian Ocean through uh, which are currently providing information to countries in the region. The system, in fact, is run by the National Center for Ocean Information Services, which is in Hyderabad. We are also the prime mover in the creation of the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, which was announced by the Prime Minister at the uh, 2019 UN Climate Action Summit. It aims to promote disaster resilient infrastructure through research and knowledge sharing in the fields of infrastructure risk management, standards, financing, and recovery mechanisms. We have also taken the lead in evolving common guidelines on HADR and common SOPs for search and rescue in the Indo-Pacific region. We are currently finalizing the guidelines on HADR cooperation within IRA and are working similarly with the EAS uh, for, for finalizing their guidelines. Now, um, when it comes to maritime security, here too, we have been uh, promoting plurilateral and multilateral cooperation uh, against uh, non-traditional security challenges, including transnational crimes, piracy, drugs, arms smuggling, and human trafficking. This area, of course, addresses the traditional domains of security, starting with maritime domain awareness, long-range identification and tracking of ships, etc. In fact, again, if you look at it, India has been taking the lead in organizing maritime security cooperation conferences under the East Asia Summit. The fourth such conference was held in Chennai in February this year, 
in partnership with Australia and Indonesia. India is also an active participant in the uh, Singapore-based Regional Cooperation Agreement on Combating Piracy and Armed Robbery against ships in, in Asia. This started when you know, there was a lot of piracy around Indonesia. We have maintained uh, deployment of ships for maritime security and anti-piracy operations in the Western Indian Ocean as well, and the Gulf of Aden since 2008, and the Gulf of Oman since 2019. They have helped greatly in addressing these threats, and what would be of interest to many of you, in reducing insurance costs. Uh, we have also been uh, at the forefront in promoting maritime safety and security, participating in plurilateral and bilater bilateral exercises, both by the Navy and the Coast Guard, for several years, have helped to build confidence, achieve interoperability, and evolve common SOPs between forces of different nations. We have been leading the efforts in the region to promote what is called white shipping information exchange through an information fusion center, which is located in Gurugram. Several countries have uh, already joined this effort, and many more are keen to do so. Uh, India's maritime domain awareness initiatives have strengthened capabilities of several countries, uh, and we have also helped uh, with, with equipment, with training, and we have assisted with hydrographic survey uh, which has supported the charting of waters for some countries. And I can tell you many more countries are actually interested in that. Now, uh, despite our best efforts, the fact is that India doesn't have the capacity to lead cooperation uh, efforts across all the seven pillars. It is uh, with this view that we are actively seeking partnerships with like-minded countries. Uh, and uh, if I were to point to a case, uh, a case in point, so to speak, it is the maritime ecology pillar. This is a critical area where we are trying to protect the marine environment, including finding technology-based solutions to pollution and combating, in particular, uh, plastic marine litter, ocean acidification, and oxygen depletion. Most recently, in August 2020, we actually sent Coast Guard teams and equipment to Mauritius to fight a very significant oil spill there that caused an environmental emergency. Other countries helped too, obviously. But I mention this because uh, it highlights the need for regional cooperation in such emergencies. So we are particularly glad that Australia has agreed to lead cooperation in this uh, on the maritime ecology pillar of the IPOI. India and Australia will uh, together host uh, an EAS conference on combating marine pollution and marine plastic debris, hopefully sometime uh, early next year, which will bring together the larger East Asia uh, summit community. India is also part of the Bay of Bengal Large Marine Ecosystem Project that seeks to improve the lives of coastal population and to, to help with the regional management of the Bay of Bengal environment and its fisheries. Another important focus is on marine resources. Uh, this involves conservation activities, including sustainable management of fish stocks, preservation of species diversity, action against illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, IUU fishing conservation of maritime uh, protected areas, and ensuring sustainable exploitation of seabed resources. IUU fishing, and I'm sure Jamshed would agree with me here, in particular has emerged as a very important issue. And there is a need to address this through a regional framework of cooperation. India has undertaken to organize an EAS conference in that regard. India has also been providing training through the International Training Center for Operational Oceanography, which is a UNESCO designated Category 2 center at the National Center for Ocean Information Services. In addition, uh, we've, there have actually been three ASEAN India workshops on the blue economy that have been held so far. This is a platform for ASEAN India expert level discussion on developments in the blue economy, sustainable harnessing of marine resources, 
maritime connectivity and maritime safety. Two other pillars that we have identified under the IPOI are capacity building and resource sharing and capacity building resource sharing and science, technology, and academic cooperation. And I'd like to speak briefly to explain why. Under them, there is a need to achieve coordinated efforts to help increase the capacity of small island states in the Indo-Pacific so that they can safeguard their own EZs and its resources. And, and the fact is they have some real problems right now in doing so. This could include training of Coast Guard and maritime security officials, developing their legal skills, building capacity in maritime trade controls, handling fiscal tools, preparing for the blue economy, providing fishing zone advisories and ocean state forecasts, and developing mitigation strategies to deal with sea price levels. Cooperative studies in weather mapping, uh, the precipitation cycle, ocean currents, migratory maritime species, marine water quality <coughs> degradation, and sea level rise have also become increasingly important. After all, global weather patterns are significantly determined by the maritime domain. Practical cooperation in these areas would obviously be of great utility I, for the for the region, of course, but I, I think would also make a very major contribution uh, for the global environment. So that brings me to the seventh and last pillar of the IPOI, which is the trade, connectivity, and maritime transport pillar. The importance of this pillar, of course, needs very little reiteration to a gathering like this. Uh, we have been working now uh, for many years to realize greater connectivity in the region, connectivity in the fullest sense of the term. Our approach is, uh, I want to emphasize, consultative, viability-driven, and partner-based. It includes roads, shipping lines, ports, air connections, and also digital connectivity. Now, these are real opportunities for Indian companies who are prepared to look at it. We have announced a $1 billion line of credit for connectivity projects with the ASEAN. And I want to share with you that, you know, after a lot of preliminary work, projects to utilize it are now actually gathering steam. They are under now very serious discussion. We have also for some years now been pursuing the trilateral highway uh, project connecting India, Myanmar, and Thailand. And we look forward uh, to a time which shouldn't be that far away uh, to extend it eastwards towards Vietnam. Uh, we are also working on the Kaladan multimodal transit transport project uh, that provides connectivity to the Sitwe port in Myanmar. And these projects, once they are done, they will you know, change our sense of distance uh, to Southeast Asia because they will actually give us that smooth physical connectivity that we have not had uh, so far. Uh, we have also started to look at building connectivity between Andaman and Nicobar and Aceh in Indonesia. And this is focused around the port of Sabang. Uh, announced in 2018, it is really work in progress now. Uh, another interesting connectivity initiative is between Ranong port in Thailand and Vishakapatnam, Chennai, and Calcutta on our end. Uh, relevant MOUs were signed last year, uh, and again, we, we hope to take it forward. On the other coast, uh, India and Maldives are working to operationalize a cargo ferry service. Uh, we are also looking forward to building infrastructure and connectivity projects in Malay under Government of India lines of credit. Our infrastructure partnership with Sri Lanka is, is undergoing upgradation. Uh, there are very active discussions underway in a, in a variety of projects. Uh, we're also exploring third country cooperation with Japan on projects uh, out there. As for trade, uh, the Indo-Pacific is obviously central to our exports and imports. 
uh, we have a number of FTAs in place, but uh, we chose not to join the RCEP after weighing the pros and cons very, very carefully. The focus today is attracting more investments and technology partnerships as part of Atmanirbhar Bharat. The PLI schemes, we believe, could make a big difference there, as indeed our continuous efforts at making it easier to do business. So overall, the cumulative impact of these activities under all the pillars of IPOI that I have brought out, uh, they, I mean, tell you in a sense how much more we count in the world today. In this situation, the fact is that we will be judged by what we can deliver on the ground and on the seas. If our footprint is increasing, our responsibilities are growing too. They are taking us on new journeys to more destinations. They are also changing the manner in which we are engaging others. The Indo-Pacific speaks as much for the changes in the world as in our own aspirations. It truly reflects a new India, and I thank you for the opportunity today to share my thoughts on that subject.